Good afternoon, friends. Or good evening for some of you. My name is Maria Cristina Amaral. And I greet, greet everyone on behalf of the Initiative Coordinating Group. Thank you for joining. The 2025 initiative is a platform which provides a shared peer learning and meditative online space for groups and individuals from around the world with the aim to render a planetary service to meditate together in support of the vision of the new civilization to share experiences in living and manifesting spiritual laws and principles in everyday life, to learn from each other methods to develop group thinking and consciousness and to bring groups and, and to bridge groups and concepts. Before we start our work today, let us have a short alignment. Let us focus our attention in the head. And let us visualize ourselves as points of light. Today is the full moon day of cancer of building lighted houses. Let us visualize ourselves as lighted instruments for our souls. Let us connect with our souls and let us invoke soul energy. and visualize the light of the soul fusing and blending with the lighted house of the personality. Let us now to bring to our brain awareness the fact that we are millions throughout the planet and several connected in this webinar. Let us project lines of light connecting with each other, forming a sphere of light. Let us visualize this connection as a fact. We all know that energy follows thought. Let us visualize the new group as a web of stars enveloping the planet. Let us place ourselves as a group inside this web. Let us project a rainbow bridge connecting the new group of old servers with the planetary hierarchy, the heart of the planet. Let us keep in mind that this connection is a fact. Let us sound the OM affirming the fusion with the new group of old servers and inspiration from the planetary hierarchy. We can use the image you see in the screen as the image for, as a symbol of the new group of old servers, a lighted web of stars. 
And now I have a privilege to introduce our guest, guest today, Michael Robbins. Michael is one of these stars in this web. He's a committed and a long-standing disciple in the working of furthering the ageless teachings and of training people to become servers of the plan. He has been helping many students to become lighted house for the purpose of service. Probably you all know Michael and you have seen his bio in the invitation. So now I welcome Michael to start his reflection with us. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Maria Cristina. Thank you, 2025 group. I'm glad to be here with you. And if someone could make me the presenter, I could show my screen. Is that possible? Aha, OK. Thank you. <laughs> I trust that it will show soon. There it goes. All right. Well, I'm very happy to be here with you. It's um, only seven hours ago, a bit less. We had the Cancer full moon at a time when Jupiter, the great second ray planet, is also in the sign Cancer. And so the wholeness which Cancer can bring to our realization should be strongly with us. Um, the Lighted House, there are really three of them. <clears throat> this is a picture with which you are familiar. It's from Cosmic Fire, and uh, uh, Keith Bailey and AUM Group have given it color. Um, this is one of the Lighted Houses, the personality, and many of us have still much to do to create a Lighted House of our soul-infused personality. The next lighted house is the one that we're going to work on today. It's the Temple of Solomon. It's the Egoic Lotus. It's the middle chamber. It's our soul vehicle on the higher mental plane. You know, this is a picture of the planes, the different uh, frequencies of vibration which constitute what we call our cosmic physical plane, and there's a lot more. But all of these 49 different frequencies have different types of energy upon them. And this wonderful egoic lotus, uh, this is the small version of it, uh, is found on the higher mental plane. And then finally, and it will be yet for us a long way, there will be the Temple of Ezekiel, uh, which is already existing, but it will be our supremely lighted house one day when we are high initiates. Um, this is the monadic vehicle. Well, what we're going to concentrate on today is a vehicle that has been with us ever since individualization occurred. For many people on this planet, that was 21 million years ago, approximately. But many of the, um, let's say, uh, more advanced uh, students, people who are studying the ageless wisdom and who are really increasingly mentally focused, it, it took place on the moon chain, and that was billions of years ago. They, they came into our uh, Earth uh, scheme, uh, into, well, <laughs> I don't want to get too technical about this, but they, they came into our Earth, into our earth chain um, in, in early Atlantean days, around the third sub-race of the fourth root race, and they already had a number of petals unfolded, at least some of them did. These are called the petals of the egoic lotus. And they represent uh, uh, constituencies. Uh, they represent um, methods of unfoldment. They represent certain potencies. I was just waving to my wife. I, she wanted to join, join and was disappointed that <laughs> she wasn't here. OK, so my bizarre behavior. Anyway, these are potencies that unfold at different stages of the evolution of the human being. Now, uh, there are three different groups of these 
petals or vortices or radiant combinations of uh, sound, color, quality, geometry. You know, this is just a symbol. What you see here is a symbol. Uh, it was created by my wife, Tuya, basically coloring in what the Tibetan had given. Man, he had given all the colors, but he had not uh, done the coloring in cosmic fire. So the first group of petals takes millions and millions of years to unfold. And with, with the unfoldment of these petals, we are not so much concerned. Uh, there, there is a certain amount of light already in us because we, we have done this work. We've done this work uh, in, in this particular globe and on, in this particular chain, or some of it, maybe some of us have done that work on the moon chain. The, the next group of petals, uh, five, um, four, five, and six, uh, some of us are working in that area. As a matter of fact, many of us are working in that area and toward the tail end of this area. And I'll get into, this, into the specifics in a little while. And light is growing because of our work here. The, the causal body or the egoic lotus is becoming more and more radiant for all of us. Uh, on the higher mental plane, each one of us has this structure. And as we uh, experience uh, our life uh, in the lower three worlds, we are always adding color, quality, sound, vibration, to this inner lighted house, this inner temple of Solomon. Uh, so uh, the first initiation is actually taken in the second uh, group of petals. At least there is an unfoldment of petal number five, and I'll explain that in a moment. Then we get to the true petals of initiation. These are the sacrifice petals, the second group are the love petals, and the first tier is the knowledge petals. The knowledge petals apply to the physical plane, the love petals primarily to the astral plane, and the sacrifice petals to the mental plane. And these are the petals where the rod of initiation is truly applied, uh, either, by, um, either by the Christ, who officiates at the first and second initiation, the birth of the Christ in the heart, that's the first initiation, the baptism in the river Jordan, which is the purification of the astral body, that's the second initiation, and then finally the Lord of the world himself, uh, Sanat Kumara, officiates at the third initiation, which is the transfiguration. Now, all of these petals are constantly unfolding. At first, uh, the, the great solar angel, who is a deity that was once a human being in a previous solar system and is supervising almost every one of us, well, really every one of us here. There are certain groups that have not evolved very much at all that are not being supervised by a solar angel, and they will have their day of opportunity at, in a future time. But all of us, let us say, are being supervised by a solar angel, and the solar angel has infused the, uh, the matter of the higher mental plane and is substanding that and has created this 12-fold heart center, this egoic lotus heart center, which is, in a way, a miniature zodiac. And some of you who are familiar with astrology, uh, you will understand that the, uh, the uh, zodiac of constellations is actually a great heart center in a much larger being that we call our, you know, super cosmic logos, the one about whom not may be said. So we really shouldn't say too much about the one about whom not may be, may be said. Um, but anyway, it's a heart center. And as this egoic lotus unfolds more and more, our own heart center, our own heart center within the head, and the cosmic, uh, the, our, our astral heart center and heart center within the head, they all continue to be more and more stimulated. And eventually, at the third initiation, all nine of these petals, representing the, well, sort of the third aspect of the, of the love aspect of the divinity, they're all completely unfolded. And then what is left is uh, the three petals that we call the synthesis petals. Uh, petals, number, uh, uh, petals number 10, 11, and 12, they're not much marked here. They're said to be a beautiful sort of... Uh, uh, 
yellow, a, a very light and beautiful shade of yellow. That's how the Tibetan describes them. And they represent the synthesis of all our complete human evolution. So every life, we are building this lighted house. And at the time of cancer, we have particularly to focus on the kind of uh, work that we do in the world which will contribute to the lighted house. Now, what I'd like to do, um, you know, we, we can't work on all the petals at once, probably, really, uh, and, 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 and more than that, all we can do, really, as human beings, we can organize these petals by uh, working with certain types of experiences in life and achieving a degree of mastery, organize and coordinate, and we can vitalize them by becoming ever more masterful on the outer plane. But when it comes to really making the petals unfold and blossom, giving us that extra lift that we cannot accomplish by ourselves, it is other forces that are responsible for that. Now, particularly when, well, let's just say, the majority of human beings on our planet have not yet unfolded petal one, two, and three, and they may have been already spending some 21 million years in the process. Petal number one, I'll just be very brief, so you kind of get the main idea. Petal number one takes a very long time. It's called the Lemurian petal. Let's say its unfoldment might last from 21 million years ago to about 12 million years ago. The next petal, uh, it has to do with uh, emotional development, at least as relates to the physical plane. And early Atlantean times, I call it the Atlantean petal, early Atlantean times began around 12 million years ago, and perhaps, well, really, you know, they, they went almost unto 1 million years ago, and many people, in terms of their consciousness, are still very Atlantean. But perhaps maybe we could say 4 million years ago, a span from 12 million to 4 million, uh, that, that's about maybe when we can say that the Aryan race, in terms of consciousness, began to come in. And then, this is a mental petal. It's called the sacrifice petal, the knowledge sacrifice petal. Many people are not yet here. They do not really know how to think in a way that is not swayed by emotion. So there are all kinds of names for these different petals uh, and different types of lotuses that have a different amount of unfoldment. But I'm not going to worry about the, the early ones. Uh, you can pick this all up in Cosmic Fire if you like, and read this on Cosmic Fire. I'm just going to talk about three higher types of egoic lotuses. They are called uh, radiant lotuses. They are called lotuses with perfume. And they are called lotuses of revelation. Now, all of us are aspirants in the uh, ageless wisdom. We are aspirants to initiation. Until we have taken the the third initiation, we are technically speaking still an aspirant. And even after we've taken the third initiation, we're still an aspirant for some higher type of development. When we have begun to concentrate upon the fifth petal, the types of experiences related to the fifth petal, our solar angel becomes a downward gazing soul and begins to supervise in a more intensive way, the development of the human being. Before that, uh, other forces were at work supervising the unfoldment of the petal. But then this downward gazing soul, which is that higher supervisory tutelary deity, begins to take our development in hand. And for everything we do, it's like the shoemaker and the elves, you know. The shoemaker, he couldn't figure it out. He, he laid out all the parts of the shoe, and, you know, everything was perfect, but he didn't put it together. He, he put it out on the bench, and when he went to sleep, and when he woke up in the morning, there was the shoe ready-made. So another type of uh, force, in this case the elves, helped with the putting together uh, of what he had prepared. Well, we prepare many things, and the solar angel gives us a boost so that it magnifies the power that we have already put into the work of each petal. Now... Um, I, I just want to, you know, kind of briefly describe work uh, from petal number five to petal number nine. The first, uh, the first four petals I call lunar petals. It's a question of lunar and solar. 
Lunar represents the form, our normal personality, and solar represents the influence of our soul, our solar angel, as we become more and more sun-like. So the first petal is physical, the second is emotional, third is mental, and the fourth has to do with the integration of the personality, at least in the beginning of the selfish integration. But at this point, in petal number five, there's a big fight that goes on. At first, you may become a very dominant personality, as DK says, for three, seven, or maybe even 11 lives. And then and something happens, and you crash, and you fall, and you realize that you cannot be satisfied being a dominant personality. Uh, something's missing, so you begin to aspire towards what's called the higher of the pairs of opposites, which is your soul nature. So by the time you're working on those types of tasks, which associate with the end of this petal, you have become the aspirant. You have become a creative person. You have become a thinker and one who is beginning at least to wish they could contribute to something higher in the world. Now, when we, and, and, and by the way, here's how I do it. Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo. I call this a Leo petal. Now, I, I, I've done a lot of work on this, and on the Makara website, you can find a lot of programs here, over 50 programs so far, dealing with all the astrology and the rayology of the egoic lotus. And I'm telling how each one of the uh, astrological signs, each one of the planets, each one of the rays relates to every petal and the kind of uh, things that kind of energies that are given here to help the person accomplish their task in a particular petal. Now, although this is a Leo petal, it's also a Scorpio petal, and there's lots of battles as we attempt to turn our attention to the real. Now, petal number six, I in one way, it's going to fit with the sign Virgo. And uh, what I want to call it is a, uh, it's a petal that relates to the path of probation, of self-correction. You realize there are certain things that need to be cleaned up and improved, and you start to try to do that. You're still a bit selfish. You want some kind of return for what you offer to the group, yes, but you're on your way at least. So here is the path of probation sort of cleaning up and preparing for the first initiation. And that's, that's a big task. And, well, you know, a bunch of planets are involved. Don't worry about that. But if you really want to make a study of this, it's, it's fascinating. Now we go... Now we go into initiation has not yet occurred. Although you are an aspirant, although you are a probationary disciple, initiation has not yet occurred. The light of the soul is not yet fully shining, of course. We finally, we go to petal number seven, which relates to Libra. And then, I, I, I've done it many ways. There are many signs that they relate to. But I'm calling this primarily the Libra petal. Balance, equilibrium, higher mind, and it's at this point that we begin what the Tibetan calls strenuous and abnormal efforts. And because of our strenuous and abnormal efforts, um, the, even the seventh petal begins to unfold. The fifth petal is unfolding, the sixth a little bit, and due to our strenuous and abnormal efforts, we prepare the way for initiation. Then the Christ directs the energy of the rod uh, of the Bodhisattva towards this seventh petal. How he does that, you know, that's his business. There are all kinds of technicalities in here we cannot know. But this energy enters the seventh petal and causes the first initiation. And it's only once we are initiate in a certain sense that we have the birth of the Christ in the heart that this petal can be touched by the Christ because the initiate is initiate before he is initiated. And when that seventh petal is touched, the fifth petal completely unfolds. And there are marvelous references which tell us that when the fifth petal has completely unfolded, due to the reflex action occurring in the seventh, then you are the initiate of the first degree. You've experienced the birth of the Christ in the heart. But then comes the hard part. Well, well let me just say about petal number seven, it's the use of all knowledge that has been accumulated or is being accumulated for the purpose of service and to control the threefold lower man. And that control is exercised through the will, 
because these petals of sacrifice are also will petals. Okay. Now we move into the hard part, and that's petal number eight. We're still working to a degree in petal number seven. We're still accumulating knowledge. Excuse me. <coughs> Pardon me. Getting over a flu here. And we're still, uh, we're still learning how to share that knowledge for the welfare of the world, because it is a knowledge petal after all, sacrifice knowledge. But now we come to petal number eight, where an extreme amount of work has to be done. And why is that? It's a petal of sacrifice, and it involves sacrificing so much that the astral body really wants. Now, uh, the Tibetan has told us that between the first and the second initiation, a very long time takes place, maybe 30 lives, maybe 20, maybe 15 if you're fast. You know, some people think you can do it right away. But anyway, in the, in the story of the initiate Jesus, he spent 30 years between the birth and the baptism, and only three years up to the crucifixion. So you can see the proportion for yourself. And all this work is going on to learn how to sacrifice the desires of the astral body, how to be rid of the usual glamours, and meanwhile there's a reflex action occurring in the sixth petal, which is continuing to unfold due to the strenuous and abnormal efforts spent in this eighth petal. How many lives it will take, we don't know. Meanwhile, you could become an accepted disciple in this process, which is preparing for the second initiation. And then when a requisite amount of work has been done, and it is recognized that in a sense you are initiate, because using loving Venus and mystical Neptune and, and expansive Jupiter, you have uh, rendered the astral body purer and, and receptive to the higher energy of love, then the rod of initiation is then again applied, and you have taken the second initiation. That initiation will mean the complete unfoldment of the sixth petal. The seventh will unfold a bit more. The eighth is in process of unfoldment, but I at least as I'm thinking of it at the present moment until corrected otherwise, the eighth petal does not fully unfold even after the application of the rod, because there's something that looms ahead. And it is called the temptations in the desert. The world, the flesh, and the devil wait at the midway point between the second and the third initiation. And until we have passed the world, the flesh, and the devil, as the Christ did on a much higher turn of the spiral than we could ever aspire to, then we uh, cannot be truly in the true Syrian regime of initiation. So uh, somewhere in this eighth petal, and partially working in the ninth, we pass through the temptations, and then we are on the Syrian line of initiation, which doesn't mean we're on our way to Sirius one day, but uh, Sirius sponsors the Egoic Lotus and sponsors all unfoldment of our uh, inner uh, initiatory life. Then we work in petal number nine. And I can just say this, because I want to keep to my time limit here, approximately 20 to 30 minutes uh, uh, in this part of it. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. This petal number nine is, is amazing. We can say that it is ruled by Sagittarius. It's also ruled by Aries. It gives, a, um, it gives an orientation towards the third initiation. And when the, um, when the Lord of the world, the Ancient of Days, when the one initiator, Sanat Kumara, directs his energy into this ninth petal, it fully unfolds. And with it, every bit of the eighth and seventh that have not fully unfolded, also fully unfolded, uh, now fully unfold, and you have the full-blown egoic lotus of the third degree initiate. And what is important about this ninth petal. I, 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 D.K. calls it the utter sacrifice of all forever. About the eighth petal, he says, you sacrifice and you never count the cost. But then, about the ninth petal, he says, the utter sacrifice of all forever. Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a pretty tall order. But anyway, there is this, uh, so Capricorn is involved here as well because it's involved with the, with the third initiation. And what it means is we're finally oriented not just towards love wisdom, which all souls must be, but we are, we are beginning to be initiates into the secret of being. Being. Pure being. What is being 
Being is not love. Being is not intelligence. Being is not even will. Being is just the fact of isness. And we begin to get the idea. Uh, that's why I say that Aries is very involved here, as well as Sagittarius. And I explain all that in my, in my sort of webinar uh, book that, that's, uh, that, I, that I've worked on, you know, very hard <laughs> over a short period of time. But anyway, the, 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 the sense of, uh, uh, of the mysteries of being come into our consciousness and we're able to look at all things not because of the quality with which they express, beca but because of the fact that they are. And because they are, they are exactly the same in their arness, in their isness. In, I, I call it... Um, uh, uh, I call it by a fancy, crazy name. I call it ontological obtrusion, meaning the f the fact of being is what hits you in the face, and not the quality of what is. Of course, we don't forget quality at all. We need quality in order to advance in this relativistic world. And then, following that, of course, the synthesis petals give you a synthesis of knowledge of all things you've experienced. Uh, in these millions of years of evolution, the synthesis of love is the great love that loves everything. That's petal number 11. The synthesis of will, you begin to will as the Lord of the world wills. And your will is not your own, and you can begin to say, not my will, Father, but thine be done. And then what happens is these synthesis petals, they burst open, they reveal the jewel in the lotus, which is the... Uh, 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 representative of the monad, representative of your pure being, and then you are ready for the uh, accolade of fire. As they say, the causal body is a wonderful temple, but all temples must be destroyed at length because temples are repositories for a still higher energy which they sim symbolize and to a degree express. But at a certain point, those energies want to just express themselves as they are. And so the temple must go and all is sublimated up into what we call the spiritual uh, triad and that's this particular area at is as it is symbolically described uh, okay um, I think I'm I think I'm on time here and maybe have you know spent about 25 minutes in this now I build a lighted house and therein dwell well you know what are you going to do it's 21 million years or more of work. I sometimes think it's about 25 million years of work to get this golden flower to the point where it's ready to be destroyed by the will of the monad, by the love aspect uh, of synthesis, uh, the synthesis aspect of, uh, of the will, uh, by the atomic triangle, which is our, our permanent atoms in the lower part. All these fires make it burn up, and then we sublimate all the qualities that we have ever had. And then that, that real blaze, that's the lighted house. There's nothing like a lighted house when it's on spiritual fire. Now, <laughs> meanwhile, most of us, uh, you know, we are where we are, and I would say that the majority of people who are interested in the Tibetans' work and so forth, they're working hard in the seventh petal, and they're working hard in the eighth. And maybe they've taken the first initiation, and they are striving towards the second degree, which is a you know very tough thing. All of these colors mean something. They mean something specific. They, they, they have to do with rays and astrology and signs of the zodiac and all the rest of it. And it's an intricate study. Uh, and I just want to say, maybe, maybe I'll close with this idea. Uh, Alexander alerted me to the idea that we wanted to say, well, why is this practical in today's world. You know, maybe I'm not used to dealing with that idea, but I, I, I made up a few points here. Why is it, why is knowledge of the egoic lotus, of this Temple of Solomon, of this lighted house, why is it important in today's world? And here are some of my thoughts about that, not exhaustive, but a few. It gives us a realistic view of human evolution and its length. Uh, more realism altogether about the requirements, because every petal has its specific requirements, and the duration of the process of human evolution, which uh, absolves us of the great illusion of the quick fix. <laughs> okay, 
there, there's the presentation of a beautiful, rational design of human evolution. And you know, Master Moria says, with beauty thou hast the light. So when we see the beauty, there is a great light revealed, and we're happy to be a human being as part of this magnificently designed uh, evolution. Uh, number three, translating heaven into scientific terms. I mean, the causal body, or the egoic lotus, is up in the third heaven, and you know, if we go all the way to the top, it's called seventh heaven. Uh, <laughs> St. Paul was talking about seventh heaven, but he knew he wouldn't be understood. So it breaks the prevalent glamours concerning heaven and paradise, which are causing illusory expectations and terrible behavior, because people have such a myopic short point of view. Okay, uh, it helps us to think in subtle world identity, of subtle world identity in new terms. Now, the many people think after they die, it's just going to be their physical body somehow subtly transmuted, trans trans transformed or, or redirected or replaced into a subtle dimension. And they even expect that all the appetites right here on the physical plane will somehow be fulfilled. <laughs> you know, there's some ludicrous stuff going on about that. We need to think of our identity in a different way. What are we after all? Well, you know, we're the only thing that is, of course, and we have no form. But, but even if we have the form of the temple, the lighted house on the uh, higher mental plane, that's something to disabuse us of the idea that we are the, uh, the biped, the skin-encapsulated ego. You know, Master Mori refers to us as the bipeds. Not very complimentary. Okay, another point. It's, uh, the egoic lotus uh, is a symbol of the labor and responsibility involved as one takes one's evolution in hand. What does it really take? Well, every phase of evolution has its specific requirements, and you have to do these things. It doesn't make any difference what rays you have, what, what astrological signs or planets you have. You have to use all of your energy to accomplish specifically what that pedal requirement demand. So we get very, very realistic about what we have to do because it's all spelled out for us. And finally, if I may say, a deeper realization of what true psychology, esoteric psychology really is. It's the coming psychology. It's the psychology of the rays of esoteric astrology. It's the psychology of the egoic lotus. So we're going to learn something more about what man really is. And that's got to help in a world that is so divided, so beglamored, so full of illusion, following vain imaginings as if they really lead someplace. We need the ageless wisdom as never before. And uh, DK said that this section uh, in Cosmic Fire would be studied more than any other, more than the beginning, more than the end. It's the section on solar fire. And this is the very heart of solar fire, the egoic lotus. All right, now maybe what I do, um, I have a little kind of meditation. Maybe, maybe you think of some questions, okay, if you have questions, discussions, whatever. But just having given this um, kind of very brief and, I'm sorry, very rapid outline <coughs> of some of the specifics of the lighted house, I'd like to offer a little meditation which will allow you uh, to question yourself about what's really going on in your egoic lotus, which is the true treasury of your life. It has all those qualities which you have built. Now, you know, maybe realistically we can understand where we are, and since these are days of distribution, well, we're, well, frankly, we're still in the <laughs> we're still in the period of reception and safeguarding. We're still in the twelve hours after the full moon, which is so important for still receiving this fantastic holistic energy and the fusing of all things. And then, of course, comes the the days of uh, distribution. But I have a, a little meditation here, and. You know, you don't have to follow this. This is just for me to follow, and, and you can close your eyes or whatever, you know. But what I'm going to do is just ask yourself some questions. Ask you some questions about your inner life. 
and you can answer them as you <coughs> as you choose to do and see if we can get some realism about all this so the first thing would be that we realize ourselves as the soul a group conscious being we are behind and within the customary self. We are not the customary self. When you look in the mirror, that's not really you. It's a projection of some energies, and you are the observer. And the ultimate observer is the spirit itself. So we are all together, however many of us there are here, maybe a goodly group, some 70 people and staff, but we are souls together in union with each other on the plane of soul. And each one of us has a different story. More or less, we are spiritual aspirants. We are striving to understand the higher of the pairs of opposites which is the soul. About the lower of the pairs of opposites, the personality probably we know plenty over millions of years. So I will... It's as if you're using your soul mind to ask yourself these questions. And then we will distribute some energies accordingly. What is, as a soul, not just a mind answering this, but a deeper being answering this. What is the nature of your aspiration? I'm going to the latter part of pedal five here. Is it increasingly selfless, or are you still asking something for the apparently separated self? And if so, what are you asking? What is the nature of your aspiration? And view humanity and visualize many human souls, as many as possible, doing what is right in this regard of aspiration, and see if you can see, imagine, the beneficent, the beneficial consequences of right aspiration. How the world's desire nature would be reoriented. Not all can so aspire, but some can, and what difference would it make? Now let us move our focus to the tasks associated with pedal number six. Are you endeavoring to give up your personal desires for the sake of your group? 
are you noticing in your energy system what is amiss, what is not functioning as well as it could? And are you attempting to correct this for the sake of your group? Let's ponder on that. And if we viewed humanity, could we visualize the many human souls doing what is right in this regard? This regard of giving up their personal desires for the sake of their group. This regard of correcting Virgo-like, the imperfections which they detect in their nature so that the group may benefit. We see as many souls as possible, that is, souls in incarnation, doing this. And then would come the time, somewhere in the seventh pedal process, where the fifth pedal would completely unfold due to the application of the rod of initiation. And so let us ask ourselves with all sincerity, because it is not a foregone conclusion as we build this lighted house, do I feel that the Christ has really been born in my heart? And how do I know? Is it true? how much sacrifice is required if this is to happen and more is to come more sacrifice in these petals of sacrifice let us assume that the Christ the soul is born in our heart how am I using my higher knowledge 
arrived at through contact with my higher self? Am I really using it to control my lower self, my threefold personality? Am I offering it in service to my fellow human beings? What am I doing with my knowledge that I have accumulated or am accumulating from without and from within? What am I doing with it? Now this very difficult eighth pedal. Sometimes we organize far ahead of what is unfolded. We work out of it. And later comes the result. <coughs> Am I learning really to subdue personal desire? Sacrificing it. Am I asking nothing in return for the sacrifices that I offer? And the cost is heavy for many. And am I therefore opening the door to higher contacts which rampant personal desire blocks Am I opening the door to these qualities of the second initiation, which is called, which are called mental illumination and spiritual intelligence? Am I clearing myself of glamours so that the intuition can enter and the astral body be calm and tranquil and reflective of the higher light and love. It's a tall order. Am I doing these things really? Many lives may be involved. While not all glamours will be cleared in the approach to the second initiation, many must be. And 
And as we would view humanity, we can visualize those souls who can actually accomplish this higher task doing the right thing in this regard. Offering sacrifice without expectation of reward, clearing away the personal desires in favor of that which the group needs, opening the door to the light of the soul, achieving spiritual intelligence, and what would be the beneficent effect of this in humanity? this would take us to the place where we could successfully <clears throat> detach from the physical plane, the so-called world, the flesh or desires of the astral plane affecting the physical plane, and the devil of pride which is the overly accentuated ahamkara or selfness principle, as if we are separate. We overcome so much separation in the work of this eighth petal. And finally, something harder for all of us, do we really recognize what illusion is Are we able to sacrifice the illusion of this separate selfness, the illusion of separate selfhood? To what extent do we really realize there is no my soul or thy soul, but only the one soul, the one being of humanity, really realizing this. Examine yourself carefully. Under these Cancerian, Neptunian influences, can the <coughs> limiting Ahamkara, that separate selfness, melt away somewhat, so we begin to blend and fuse with each other, which is the fact. Maybe every once in a while we realize it, the dragon's eye blinks for a split second, and oneness is there. The one, the gift of the ninth petal. And how interesting, <clears throat> associating cancer with it, a great mantra in cancer, the whole is seen as one. That's what we're striving for. I am the one, I, God. I am the form in which all forms are merged. I am the soul 
in which all souls are fused. I am the life, and in that life all little lives remain. the gift of realization in the ninth petal, and on into the synthesis as our lighted house becomes brighter and brighter until it ends in a real supernova, a blaze of glory, and we as the monad and the jewel and the lotus are set free to enter the planetary mind, the planetary heart, and the planetary will as they express in our solar system and on this planet. I build a lighted house and therein dwell. But the building is specific and the tasks are specific and the time Time is lengthy, and the tools are the energies which we are given through our ray chart and our astrological chart and our long experience in being human. Now, let us sound internally and silently a long ohm as we imagine that we and many others have achieved this full-blown egoic lotus. There will even be many masters in the immediate future, D.K. tells us. Amazing thought. All are rising, and we sound the Om internally, silently, uniting with the sense of oneness, which is so strong at the Cancerian festival when the whole is seen as one. Okay, friends, just want to be on time here. I guess we're at the point. I know this is done a little bit differently in order, but we've had a little discussion of the lighted house in, in terms of the specifics of the Egoic Lotus, and we've had a little meditation in which we, viewing our personality as if we were the soul, which we are, we try to understand where in this process we are and what we have yet to do. It's just another perspective on our discipleship work, but it's a perspective which is, I think, very interesting and can help us understand what we have to do next. DK said, really, all you need to know is the constitution of the human being and your next step ahead. So. The Egoic Lotus serves both of these. All right, so if there are thoughts, questions, um, ideas, whatever, I'm willing to address them in the approximately 20, 25 minutes we have left. Hopefully that, that didn't space us out so much that, <laughs> you know, with Neptune you have to be careful because... Neptune is quite a spacey planet. It's going to rise. It doesn't have, have too many roots. It's going to raise you right up to the higher levels. 
So if there are thoughts anybody would like to, and I'll tell you what, I maybe someone can mediate this. Is it is it you, Alexander, whoever? Uh, um, people raise their hand, I suppose, and then uh, the question whether it's written or whether it is um, spoken will be directed to me. Is that correct? I'm ready to go. Not that I have all the answers, but I'll give it my best shot. Uh, yes, so I will help with mediating that. And uh, please use the raise your hand button on your control panel, or you can write down, write your questions in the chat window. <clears throat> And yes, it's <coughs> Neptune made a job, and it's yeah. I I feel its impact, and it's difficult to focus back into the kind of question and impression. Neptune did his job, right? Yes. <laughs> That's the one problem about maybe having the meditation. There, there's good for continuity of of content, but then if it lifts us too high above the area where questions are formed then Neptune has uh, done its job and uh, well if we can sustain that sense of oneness. See Neptune is the second ray monad. It's maybe the most powerful planet in our whole solar system in an occult esoteric way. It is um, the DK has actually given the monadic rays, the spirit rays of the planets. Uh, he, uh, you can find that on page 420 uh, uh, of Esoteric Psychology, Volume 1. Uranus, Ray 1, Neptune, Ray 2, Saturn, Ray 3, and Neptune is this gorgeous, beautiful, deep blue, you know. If you re you look at what the Voyager has taken, the, the photographs there, it's fantastic, and it gives you the sense of the deep love-wisdom monad uh, connected with the heart of the sun uh, of Neptune. Uh, it got a six-ray soul, okay, but the basic ray, the fundamental ray is ray two, so if we can sustain that love-wisdom aspect of Neptune for the next few days, we're going to do all right. <clears throat> um, Michael, I, I have a question. Yeah. You know, only like at the, at the, by the end of meditation, I had this aha moment, how beautiful this topic and how relevant it is. Actually, because yeah, uh, <laughs> sorry for this yeah. delay, delay in my realization, but as yeah. it, it's really even this topic, <laughs> it's really our job of building our house, building our temple, and see where we are and what is our next step. So it's our discipleship's responsibility. And so, how would you see that if to connect this topic with the topic of cycles. We are now in the beginning of the nine-year cycle. In nine years, it's a cycle of development of consciousness, evolution of consciousness. How can we use this okay. unity of cancer energies and the beginning of the new cycle energies, how we could wor use it in our work to progress as disciples? Where do well, you know, we get at the end yeah. of nine years? Well, you know, in nine years something can happen because it's such an intense time and we're in the last oh, 11 years of the era of the forerunner. So we know, <clears throat> as you, you, you know more than I, that in 2025 the hierarchy will lay probably, the Tibetan said, will most likely probably lay its plans for the first stages of the externalization of the hierarchy. So the so much has to be cleared away before this can really happen. You know, the, the churches, which means the esoteric groups as well, have to clean house. The, there has to be the, the sharing of, um, of, of resources, and uh, gosh, what's the other one? There's, you know what it is. Uh, somehow it's it's falling away from my mind. We we have to oh peace, <laughs> peace, a measure of peace has to be restored. 
Now, when you think about consciousness and cancer and Neptune and breaking down the barriers between people and seeing each other all as part of the same thing and projecting that idea so we begin to empathize with each other and we feel what everybody is feeling, you know, when misfortune strikes, you know, that, that, that global compassion under Neptune, we've seen it happen. We've seen the victims of the, of the typhoons, of the earthquakes, we, uh, of, the, of the wars. The, the idea of oneness and compassion have to be cultivated like never before in order to break down this terrible Mars attitude. Mars has to be defeated now by Venus and Neptune, at least temporarily defeated. It's a god, of course. You can't defeat a god. But it has to be put in its proper place. It's a non-sacred planet. It was so close to the Earth just a little while ago. Uh, what was it, 70,000 miles or something like that? As, or no, no, as close it is, as it has ever been in 70,000 years. That's what it was. And so many people are responding to that divisive Mars attitude. We have to cultivate compassion, oneness, empathy during these next nine years. That's what will make consciousness really grow to the realization of oneness. That's all I could say at the moment, but you know, you know more about the cycles there, but I, if it's a cycle of consciousness, it's about sensitivity. And Neptune is the very essence of sensitivity, and thus cancer as well. <coughs> See when that that nine year cycle. When does that when does that uh, end? Is that uh, now? It's twenty twenty three. Is that it? Yes, is correct. That when it's said to end, yeah. Alexander. Twenty 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 three. Okay. Well, you know, three year cycles, nine year cycles. <clears throat> the important thing is working consciously with the big group cycles and working consciously with your horoscopic and your ray cycles too. See, it, it's just about conscious living, and so many of us, we allow uh, ourselves to fall into reactivity, and we do not become proactive and, and plan our life. I'm not very good at it, you know. Planning our, our life in a way that takes best advantage of the energies which are available to us. Of course, every full moon is a tremendous opportunity, and that's how you build the causal body. Every Every full moon is a great opportunity, and every month to practice of particular qualities which will build into the causal body due to our practice. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank, thank you, Michael. Um, we invite yes, people you, to Alexander. ask. I mean, you know, it's a it's a vast subject. This is a vast. <laughs> Yeah, all of human evolution is contained in this flower with the jewel in the center. And it's sort of representation of Shambhala. I think uh, Natuya made this diagram with the correct colors, and I think there are something like 24, I believe it's 24 uh, points in the center, and the star Sirius, in a way, in the center as well. 24 is the number of Shambhala, as we know. And Sirius sponsors all of these. Uh, it, it's the cardinal cross, and then the the power points at 15 degrees. It's the uh, it's the eightfold star that is there in the center. It, it's you know it's like trying to grasp all of human evolution at once. But the point is, every one of us has to realize this is going to happen. For every one of us, the light is increasing, and the light can increase dramatically now if we just get a hold of these next 11 years of the forerunner and look you, you know it, it applies to everyone there's no unfoldment without sacrifice so what is the nature of our sacrifice what what really are we sacrificing and to what extent you know the old saying and it's so harsh and so beautiful to those who give all all is given. So, you know, the, the big question about how we unfold in these tremendous years of opportunity is what are we willing to sacrifice? 
I mean, and it's going to happen on three levels. The ultimate sacrifice is the causal body, but let's not worry about that. We're not about to do that, <laughs> but and nor can we, because it's a great privilege to be able to do that. But we can do so much on the physical plane, so much on the astral plane, so much on the mental plane. We can get a hold of our thoughts and make sure they are sacrificially aligned with the very best archetypes we can find. It's a big job. It's a privilege to have some energy and have some life in these next 11 years. And your group, 2025, of course, uh, is based upon that realization, I'm sure. <coughs> I, I've been working on this, I mean, you know, I've been working on this... Uh, I've got a webinar book going. It's on the Makara website, you know, makara.us. And I, I discover pedal by pedal, taking this pedal by pedal. It's so fascinating. So, you know, there's a lot there for people, and uh, it's the whole subject of our human evolution, really, and of the temple that we want to live in. We want to live in this causal temple. If you live in your lighted house, you are an initiate of the, the third degree. If you simply receive the light from the lighted house, okay, then those are the earlier degrees, and that's wonderful too. Okay, uh, Michael, so what's up, Maria Christina? Uh, um, what you, how would you relate the development of the egoic lotus petals to the to humanity today? And also okay. to the new group, how okay. uh, in what in what tier would you guess about the human as a throat center of the logos, and uh, the new group as the Ajna center? Okay, can I can I do that? What I can do is say that every member of the new group of world servers, real members, must be <laughs> astonishingly an initiate of the second degree. He tells us that the members of the new group of world servers must be on the lookout for those who have taken the second degree and the first degree. He actually says that. Now, of course, that's quite a you know we can be serving and all of that, but what he calls the the really inner part of the new group of world servers. This is pedal number eight. This is unfoldment of pedal number eight, almost the complete unfoldment of pedal number eight, as far as I can understand, and involves a, a real heart center. The throat center is assumed, and the direction of the Ajna center is very interesting because Mercury is so strong in Scorpio. Now, this eighth petal is the Scorpio petal. Uh, it's many other things, but it's that too. And at a certain point in, in our evolution, it's not just Venus that is at work here. It's Mercury itself giving a very strong energy directing ability to the Ajna center. So the new group of world servers can send energy here and there and intelligently direct using Mercury, the guardian of the eighth gate. Uh, so the throat center, of course, you know, it's beyond that. When it comes to humanity, the real truth is we have a number of quite primitive Brahmic lotuses. We have a little bit more unfolded lotuses of Brahman. Then we have what's called the lotuses of passion and desire, and that's where just about everybody is. Lotuses of passion and desire, and they are intelligent, and they can think as need arises, says the Tibetan, but they have not unfolded the third petal. And that is the object of their attention, and that's where humanity is. Now, I at least, you know, uh, speaking just in general, uh, the whole second tier of petals has to do with coming to terms, the love petals has to do with coming to terms with what's called the pairs of opposites. So when we get into petal number uh, four, we begin to be aware of a kind of higher self. In petal number five, we, we really begin to aspire towards it. In petal number six, we begin to obey it. Humanity is not there yet, but because the Christ is so intensely approaching, because DK did say this, he said, when the Christ appears, now we don't know when that is, okay, it will mean that humanity has taken the first initiation. And of course that means that a certain 
number, in, a requisite number of humanity has to taken the first initiation. So basically, there's a lot of throat center development in petal number three. And that's where the majority of human beings are working, learning how to think in a manner that can somewhat dissociate from their feelings. In other words, learning to defeat the Kama monastic response. Now, when it gets into the love tier, okay, we're working there and more advanced people are found there, but the majority of humanity is not. But certainly the men and women of goodwill are. And the new group of world servers, even beyond that point. So it's a, it's a spread. Let's just say that the people who are still involved with the second petal and the first petal, there's not much that they will react. There's not much one can expect from them because they're not going to di direct their thought towards anything that is above uh, what is personal. But when they begin to work in the third petal, they will have a mind. And when they begin to work in the, um, in the fourth, fifth, and sixth petals, then they begin to, uh, how does DK talk about it, uh, play an intelligent part in the world of affairs of their time, something of that nature. So they become the responsible citizen. Uh, and, and when they're working in the sacrifice petals, they, they need, uh, that's where the new group of world servers are working, and even men and women of goodwill. Then there will be quite interesting unfoldments that occur in the love petals, which will signify the birth of the Christ uh, in the heart. So if there's a big spread, that's all I can say. And we have people all the way from one petal almost open, almost open, all the way to the full-blown lotuses and no lotuses at all. And, you know, so it goes all the way from pedal one to pedal nine and the synthesis pedals and beyond. We find people everywhere. New group of world servers, in my view anyway, the concentration is in pedal number eight and there is unfoldment due to the application of the rod of initiation in pedal number eight. It's a big question you've asked. So it's just a brief and cursory response. <laughs> yeah, I, I just thought because uh, if uh, humanity is taking the first, the new group, as a group, I mean, it's not as individual. So they they are a step further than uh, the humanity. So it's well, just here's, here's how the thing. New group is further. The idea. Further. Yeah, but here's the thing: humanity is taking the first and not taking the first. Yeah. The the interesting thing is, I I, I this is an amazing thought. Two-fifths of those who individualized on the moon chain will not even be on the path. Three-fifths will not even be on the path until the next round. Two-fifths, by the end of the sixth root race, will be on the path. So we cannot say that humanity as a whole takes it. What we can say <laughs> is that there is a certain proportion of available human beings who can be so enlightened that they leaven the mass yeah. of humanity mm -hmm. and make sure. more rapid progress yeah. possible. But it, it doesn't mean the first initiation for, for you know, for, for all by any means. No, no. Of course. Um, of see, course. It's, a, it's a difficult question, difficult question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. uh, Michael, there are m uh, many questions in the, in the chat. I'm somehow still under Neptunian influence and missed that the questions are coming. Sorry. Uh, for those of you who asked them yeah. a while ago. So uh, Riza asks, uh, how does the incoming seventh ray influence the <coughs> petals? Uh, okay, it's, it's obviously going to make a big transformation of the etheric body. And it's going to be much uh, e easier to bring the higher energies and the lower energies together, and it will contribute to the kind of refinement that increases the sensitivity of our substance and makes progress uh, more rapid. It's, it's not just going to influence the... Uh, look, the, the whole first initiation is ruled by the seventh ray, the sacral center to the throat, as we're told, plus the birth of the Christ in the heart. So the sensitivity, the, the, the millions that can take the first initiation will uh, do so under the influence of the seventh ray the seventh pedal will be stimulated by numerical resonance and will have an acceleration of the whole process. Of course, you know, DK has written like hundreds of pages on the effect of the incoming seventh ray. But let's just say that the seventh pedal, the first initiation, the unfoldment of the fifth pedal completely 
the uh, ability to bring heaven to earth, thus the triadal energies into the uh, personality, uh, even sidestepping what we call the soul, all of that will uh, increase and acceleration will be the result. But of course, we're going to have to fight off <laughs> the so-called mental magicians. The white magicians and the mental magicians are due for a bit of a confrontation, a Master DK tells us, and so we really have to bring in the white magic of the soul, those of us who know anything about it. So it will not be a time uh, devoid of conflict. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, I will unmute Maria Cristina Donadio. And please, yeah. you can't find your uh, uh, raise your hand button. You can just write it in comments. Much love to everyone. Hello. I just had two comments. Um, first of all, I hear this shifting within humanity and giving Oh, but they, rather than saying in terms of you have to get yourself under control and, and, and dominate your lower self, I think an operative word might be to release. There's a lot of conversation that go, goes around with sacrifice as just that giving up being just a release, which is a much more beautiful, easy word to use in relation to sacrifice. Just releasing and lightening yeah, up. Yeah, it, it, is, it is also also true. Look, I'm, uh, I'm just quoting the Tibetan here, obviously. I'm, yeah, and I'm he, quoting people. I'm just quoting people. And, I'll, and then you're this off. Is, this is the particular one that I want to call attention to, if I can. Uh, it is, um, this is the seventh petal, which is so important for the um, uh, first initiation, the will to sacrifice through knowledge on the mental plane and thus intelligently to dominate the entire threefold lower man. So, you know, that's one perspective. Our nice second, our nice second ray master tells us to whip the form into shape and, you know, he, he also says he has a little first ray in his makeup and, of course, it will bring a release. In other words, discipline always brings release. That's my view of it, anyway. And thank you for your thought. Okay, there's another question. There, uh, where the further training on this subject can be found? And uh, I, I would like <laughs> to my uh, question: to be, uh, How people could sign in into your webinars, Michael? Because they're like, what you do through the webinars is just so intense, like amazing, well, you know. <laughs> expensive. Yeah. Okay. 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 Well, look, um, these webinars that I prepare, I'm afraid are, at the moment, they are sort of solo performances. In other words, that what I do is I have two computers going and that I, I make a complete program discussing these matters. So I haven't really ever done a webinar on the subject. In other words, where there's dialogue about it. Uh, I have in mind to, uh, to do some webinars on oneness. Uh, you know, in other words, the techniques of achieving uh, the realization of oneness. And that would be more of a, a dialogue type of webinar. I have not done Egoic Lotus webinars. And I'll tell you what, mostly if you, if you write to the Moria Federation uh, at is it gmail.com? My gosh, I should really know the address, shouldn't I? Um, and you ask to be put on the constant contact list, CC list, then you'll hear about the webinars. You know, we're, we're, so many of us, you know, there's different groups, your group, our group, many groups that are now using this medium, and Master DK said that the teaching would go forth over the radio. Okay, well, this is the radio, this is the modern radio, and you can be apprised of the particular uh, uh, webinars that are coming up not only by me but by other people uh, and w once I start uh, it's my hope you know I've done quite a bit of um, webinar work but it's been solo work on identification and they can be found on the on the uh, Makara site uh, Makara.us all that stuff can be found there lots of stuff but when it comes to 
doing interpersonal webinars, you will be notified if you're on our list, and uh, uh, it, it's 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 coming. Okay, it's it's coming. This is probably the first time that I've been able to talk about the Egoic Lotus with other people present, except maybe at conference, but I've gone a little more into detail here. So if you want to uh, be on that list as well, then you'll be notified uh, at moriafederation at gmail.com. You'll be mo no no notified of when such webinars would occur. Also, webinars on sacred geometry and, and the ashram and other things we have going by other uh, well uh, knowledgeable people you're most welcome to attend just as I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to attend this webinar well the, the time is uh, we already uh, ran out of time uh, and a little exceeding and there there are more questions on the list so um, but with the <laughs> yeah there even the like whole thing is just about this whole thing is just about occult training. This is just the encapsulation of the esoteric training that we're doing through the arcane school, school of esoteric studies that we're we're doing through the Moria Federation, the University of Seven Rays. We're doing this through masonry. We're doing this occult training, and it's just step by step. And the fortunate thing about this egoic lotus. It's just such a marvelous symbol. It's a fact and a symbol at the same time and helps us consolidate our view of how all this training might proceed. All I can say is just uh, devour the books of the Tibetan in the most careful and meticulous manner and we'll all be ready then for the third uh, dispensation of his writings which will come out from 2025 and onward and not before. <laughs> no matter what the claims may be. We are so far lacking a, a, a very full understanding of the Tibetan's material that why in the world would he give any more until we can somehow uh, absorb more and apply more? And besides, it's according to the, to the cycles after 2025. So as you wish, and if there are other questions, uh, you know, if you want to collect them, uh, Alexander, uh, you can collect them. You want to send them to me, and uh, I might make a little a tape or something, you know, a little, uh, a little one of these uh, solo webinars, and send it to you, and maybe they would answer some of the questions. Yes, absolutely. And uh, maybe some of the answers we can just post on our website, and the recording of this webinar will be sure. on our website, uh, 2025initiative.org. Uh, hopefully already tomorrow so everyone could listen again and um, yeah as Michael said the, the email uh, so you probably that would be also a good way to contact you Michael right yeah that's that's fine you know I, I'll do my best to answer uh, infinitize8 at gmail.com that's my that's my code you know <laughs> Why? I'll just write it out if you if you want to. Uh, infinitize eight at gmail dot com. So if you if you want to write, you you're welcome to. And I, as I say, probably the most efficient way, if there are further questions, uh, I'll I'll just make a little um, just a, a, a little uh, program that addresses these things. And then of course, if you want to know more about the subject and you have patience, of course patience is really necessary, uh, there's a lot on Makara, some 50 something programs on this subject, uh, only this subject, and more to come. So uh, it's a deep study and I'm very happy to have uh, had the opportunity, been invited, thank you Alexander, Maria, Christina and all the members of the initiative, thank you so much for having me uh, as a presenter. Thank you very much, Michael. It's so intense and so, so much life. <laughs> what are you saying? So <laughs> interesting subject. <laughs> really appreciate okay. accepting your our, our invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay. And uh, our next webinar will be on um, August seventh, uh, and it will be the second part of. 
our um, <laughs> webinar, the second webinar, part of our webinar that we had in Aquarius, and it's on the topic of electrical age of Aquarius and electric universe. And this uh, part two will be on the secrets of water. And it would be, uh, this webinar would be, uh, will be with Lawrence Newey from London, Mins van der Velde from Switzerland, and Dominic uh, Dibble from the, uh, London. And they will represent the Lucy's Trust headquarters group. So it should be very interesting, very fifth ray focused webinar. So please join it on August 7th. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.